I'll call this uh, hearing to order. Uh, Ranking Member Rush, uh, I know, has been in Illinois and was expected to be delayed on his return, but we do expect him to be here soon. Certainly, Ranking Member Waxman is here. So, as I said, I'll call this hearing to order entitled the American Energy Initiative. And I would say that this is the uh, second hearing that we've actually had on this topic of the American Energy Initiative. And it's going to be a wide-ranging discussion of the domestic energy needs of our country and the impact that decisions in other parts of the world have on what we are proposing to do here. The dominant area of focus in today's discussion is the rising role of China. Uh, for the past 30 years, China has experienced a remarkable economic boom in an effort to modernize and assert its position in the global economy. In fact, the International Energy Agency uh, recently projected that the world will require 40 percent more energy in the next 25 years. Now, that's quite an increase in demand for energy. And I might also say that the International Energy Agency has called China, China a, a coal-fueled economic miracle. Last year, China became the largest energy consumer in the world. The economic progress in China has been made possible through the availability of affordable, secure, and abundant sources of energy. China understands the importance of acquiring the resources necessary to power new manufacturing consumers, fuel millions of new automobiles, and electrify the homes and businesses of the world's largest population. Becoming the largest energy consumer in the world has helped China become the U.S. chief economic competitor. As a result of the tremendous surge in demand, world energy markets have taken notice and are adjusting. China's increased oil demand over the past 10 years has had a major impact on global oil prices. Coal consumption in China has risen at a tremendous rate and is projected to continue on the same path for the foreseeable future. Nuclear, renewable, and alternative energy technologies have also taken significant steps forward this decade as well. China is playing for keeps in its quest to modernize its economy, become globally competitive, and improve the standard of living for 1.3 billion citizens. To do so, it realizes the value in pursuing energy in all its forms. Rather than abandoning fossil fuels in exchange for renewable energy, China continues to burn coal at an astonishing rate, using 3.5 times more coal than the U.S., and building last year one new coal-fired plant every two weeks with technology that exceeds our own. It is reported they are undergoing a safety review as a result of the situation in Japan, but China, my understanding, is continuing to build 25 nuclear plants, 25 times more than the U.S. is building. China leads the world in hydroelectricity usage. China is the second largest consumer of oil behind the United States, but the difference is quickly shrinking. During the recession, instead of billions of dollars of wasteful stimulus spending, the Chinese put their billions toward ensuring oil resources around the globe, some with our allies, but some with countries who are not. With this hearing, we hope to explore these issues and many more. If we are to win the future, as our president says, we must understand the role China plays in energy markets and the various sectors affected by it. Part of this strategy must be to prevent the EPA from increasing U.S. energy prices by regulating greenhouse gases through the Clean Air Act and allow for the environmentally friendly use of our domestic resources such as coal, natural gas, and oil. Greenhouse gas regulation and policies to stop the use of domestic sources of fuel make the U.S. less competitive with China, not more. Instead, we must unleash the innovation and efficient allocation of resources made possible only through a free enterprise system in the absence of burdensome federal regulations and mandates. 
On the subject of oil, as you know, there's about 85 million barrels of oil being produced each uh, day throughout the world. They're projecting by the year 2030 that China alone may be consuming 50 million barrels of oil. That's a lot of oil. So we look forward to the testimony of our witnesses today. And Mr. Rush, uh, we're delighted to see you. Uh, we appreciate your coming back from Illinois. I know that you had some issues you were dealing with there. And if you're prepared at this time, I would uh, recognize you for your introductory remarks. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the guests for uh, being here today. Today's hearing is timely in that it follows on the heels of President Obama's call to decrease the nation's import of foreign oil by one-third in 10 years, as well as the President's call to stop the drastic cuts forwarded in Republican-backed proposals to the Department of Energy programs such as the Renewable Energy Loan Guarantee Program and the Office of Science, which invests in basic energy research. I find it quite ironic, ironic, Mr. Chairman, that we hold this hearing focus on, focusing on China's energy portfolio and the implications for jobs and energy prices in the U.S. against the backdrop of my Republican colleagues' continuous calls for cuts of our own investment uh, in the technologies and programs that will help build and strengthen our economy for the future. As President Obama noted in his speech last week, and I quote, we want to cut our research and development into uh, new technologies. These cuts will eliminate thousands of private sector jobs, terminate scientists and engineers, and end fellowships for researchers, graduate students, and other talent we desperately need for the 21st century. At a moment like this, sacrificing these investments would weaken our energy security and make us more dependent on oil, not less dependent on oil. That's not a game to win the future. That's a vision to keep us mired in the past, I, uh, in the quotes. As China steadily increases its own investment in clean energy technology, my colleagues on the other side are proposing drastic cuts to the very program that will help us uh, compete in the 21st century. In one of my amendments to the Upton Inhofe Bill in the full committee markup, I repeatedly cited China's investment in clean and re uh, renewable energy technologies as yet another reason why both the Republican Pass H.R. 1 continuing resolution and the Upton Inhofe Bill were bad policy for this country. H.R. 1 would drastically reduce Department of Energy loan guarantees for renewable energy and energy efficiency projects by billions of dollars. And up to Inhofe would prohibit EPA from regulating greenhouse gases, which would in turn hinder additional research and development in this country for newer, cleaner energy technologies. Like President Obama articulated, many of my constituents also feel that we cannot afford to relinquish our leadership role in the area of investment in clean and renewable energy, not to China, not to anyone. My constituents understand that investing in these technologies will provide jobs and business opportunities here in America that can help propel our economy forward. Mr. Chairman, just weeks ago in the hearing on this on the Department of Energy's budget, Secretary Chu confirmed the importance of investing in clean energy technologies and told us that the draconian cuts proposed by my Republican colleagues would make the U.S. much, much less competitive globally. Repeating this thing just last Thursday in a speech before the National Academy of Sciences, Secretary Chu emphasized the importance of investing in science scientific research as being crucial for our security now as it was during the Cold War. When speaking about the race between the U.S. and China in investing in clean energy technology and how we have ceded ground to the Chinese, Secretary Chu said, and I quote, Chinese leaders are moving aggressively not because of environmental 
concerns, but because they see great economic potential. He went on to say that China, and I quote, has taken over the world in high-tech manufacturing. That's our Sputnik moment. This is not a threat to our national security or our missiles, but our economic security. And despite some of the testimony that we may hear today, downplaying China's commitment to aggressively increase its investment in clean energy technology, I will point to the report just issued by the Pew Charitable Trust. The Pew report found that for the past two years, China has outpaced the U.S. in clean energy investment. In 2010, China attracted $54.4 billion in clean energy technologies, a 39% increase from 2009 compared to just $34 billion in the U.S. In fact, Pew reports that the U.S. has slipped from first to third in clean energy investment in the span of just three years, ranking behind. both China and Germany, which doubled its investment in solar installation to $41 billion in 2010. Mr. Chairman, the American people will not accept us willingly ceding ground to other countries in this race to secure the future. As President Obama, Secretary, Secretary Chu, and a host of other leaders have warned, we cannot sacrifice our investment in clean energy now if we expect to lead the world in the future. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rush. At this time, Mr. Bill Bray, I'll recognize you for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you holding this hearing, and especially the emphasis on what is going on in China, because, you know, you hear a lot of people saying, let's, let's invest in this, let's do that. Let me tell you something. If you look at the statistics of China, it sure looks a lot like the um, let's do it all proposal, short of the fact that they, they tend to have no commitment to expansion of solar. The fact is the Chinese are finding reasons to do things rather than finding excuses not to do things. Just in their nuclear involvement uh, uh, commitment themselves, we're looking at a threefold increase. In fact, um, the latest data is that, that we've seen is they, they're looking at 20 new units um, going in and uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, we have, what, two, maybe three, possibly. We're talking about an economy that's one-tenth our size. That's almost 100 times more commitment to nuclear than what we're talking about in this country. And let me point out that there are opportunities for us. Um, some may say, but what about the safety issue? The fact is, next generation uh, technology, like, such as gas-cooled reactors, totally avoid the, the problem that we've seen in Japan and some of the concerns there. At the same time, addressing one of the, the big bugaboos that we've talked about with nuclear, nuclear, and that is the disposal issue. The fact is gas cool reactors have the potential to be developed um, very quickly to be able to not only um, use uranium, but also to be able to use plutonium and burn up not only weapons-grade material, but also waste waste from other power plants. These are all technologies that we ought to be pushing forward now, continue to push forward rather than retreating. Obviously, from the data we see here, Mr. Chairman, China is not retreating. They are not stalling. They are not putting moratoriums. They are going full steam ahead into a future that provides their citizens with cost-effective energy. And we darn well ought to be leading them, not following them down this road. And I yield back to Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do we, today uh, we have an opportunity opportunity to dispose of some persistent myths about China and energy that we've heard from special interest groups for years. It has become almost an article of faith among those who oppose any efforts to cut domestic carbon pollution that China will never take meaningful action to cut their pollution. For years they have argued, why should we take steps if China refuses to? Today we'll hear that this is a myth and China is taking action. In its new five-year plan, China set a target of reducing carbon dioxide emissions per unit of GDP by 17 percent by 2015. That means fewer carbon emissions for each dollar of economic growth. The Chinese have set a goal of getting over 11 percent of China's energy from non-fossil fuels by 2015. That target includes 70 gigawatts of new wind capacity, which is equivalent to over 100 coal-powered plants. 
Uh, China's current wind capacity is 41 gigawatts, and that's already the highest wind capacity in the world. The five-year plan also calls for China's successful industrial energy efficiency program to be expanded. These targets are consistent with meeting China's commitment under the Copenhagen Accord to reduce its carbon intensity by 40 to 45 percent from 2005 levels by 2020. Chinese officials are even talking about pilot cap and trade programs and a carbon tax to reduce pollution. China has also shut down 70 gigawatts of its most inefficient coal-fired power plants. Last year, investment in China's clean energy sector rose to over $54 billion. That made them the world's leader in attracting clean energy investment. The United States ranks just third in the world with $34 billion in clean energy investments. We're now behind China and Germany. The Chinese are now the world's largest manufacturer of wind turbines, and they're the world's largest manufacturer of solar panels. Over the next decade, the global clean energy market is going to be worth $2.3 trillion. The Chinese know this and are pursuing policies that will help them compete. China's number one priority is jobs and economic growth. They know that clean energy and climate policies create jobs and economic opportunities. While China is moving forward, we're headed in reverse. The Republican budget cuts, investments in renewable energy and energy, excuse me, the Republican budget cuts investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency by 35 percent. So we're going in the wrong direction. This week, the House will take up legislation to block EPA's modest carbon pollution requirements for the nation's largest polluting facilities. The policy being pursued in the committee is based on science denial, and it will be an economic debacle for our nation. Money, investments, and jobs will flow to China and other nations that are investing for the future. We need to stop the partisan fear-mongering. We should embrace setting common-sense, cost-effective rules of the road for carbon pollution, ensuring that our largest facilities are energy, energy efficient is going to boost their competitiveness and spur innovation. Ambitious clean energy policies are going to produce clean energy jobs. China has figured it out. We need to start getting serious about winning these global clean energy markets. I look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses, especially Debbie Seligson from the World Resources Institute. She is an expert based in China and can tell us what's really happening on the ground there. And I'm she's pleased she's here with us today. I yield back uh, the balance of my time. Thank you very much. And at this time, we will go to our panel of witnesses. Uh, we have with us this morning Mr. Stephen Kopitz, who's Managing Director for Douglas Westwood. We have Mr. Fred Palmer, who's Chairman of the World Coal Association. We have Ms. Deborah Sickelson, who's Principal Advisor, Ch China Climate and Energy Program with the World Resources Institute. And we have Mrs. Mary Hutzler, Distinguished Senior Fellow Institute for Energy Research. Once again, I welcome you to the hearing. We appreciate your being here. We look forward to your testimony. And Mr. Kopitz, I'll recognize you for five minutes of your opening statement. Be sure and turn your microphone on. Which button is it? All right. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I am deeply honored for the opportunity to appear here before you today to discuss China's oil and gas markets. Our firm, Douglas Westwood, is a leading consultancy in market research covering oil field services offshore and in difficult to access markets like China and Russia, among others. I manage our New York offices and I am solely responsible for any opinions expressed herein. Let's begin with China's oil demand. China consumes 10 million barrels of oil per day on global consumption of about 88 million barrels. China is already the second biggest consumer uh, of oil in the world, as the chairman has noted. How will China's demand develop? 
The historical record suggests that oil demand evolves quite similarly across a range of countries, with demand ascending an S-curve as a country motorizes. China entered this S-curve around 2005, and we forecast China to reach steady state consumption in the 2025 to 2030 period. At that time, we would anticipate China might have per capita oil consumption around that of South Korea, implying demand in excess of 50 million barrels a day. That contrasts to the U.S. with 19 million barrels of, of uh, consumption today. Further, we see China surpassing U.S. consumption levels around 2018. As for China's oil supply, China's conventional oil fields are mature. The country currently produces around 4.5 million barrels a day, and this level is anticipated to remain broadly stable for the rest of the decade. Like the U.S., China currently meets about half its needs through imports, and this is new. As late as the 1990s, China was self-reliant in oil. Today, um, today, it must be active in global markets to secure domestic needs. Indeed, it has to obtain about an additional 1 million barrels per day each year just to keep up with demand. And the situation will deteriorate markedly in the coming decade. By 2020, China's dependence on foreign oil may be as much as 80 percent versus an anticipated 40 percent for the U.S. China's vulnerability is a cause for concern for that country's uh, policymakers. Turning to natural gas, China consumed 3.9 trillion cubic feet of natural gas in 2010. The U.S. consumed six times as much. China's per capita consumption is even lower, about 1 26th of U.S. As a consequence, there is considerable scope for rapid consumption growth of natural gas in China well past 2030. China's natural gas demand surged 22 percent last year, and growth has averaged nearly 15 percent over the last decade annually. We anticipate this pace to continue. This would imply demand doubling to 2015 and nearly quadrupling from current levels to 2020. China's natural gas production has tripled in the last decade from 1 trillion cubic feet in 2000 to 3.3 trillion cubic feet in 2010, a growth rate over 13 percent per annum. We project this to double to 6 trillion cubic feet in 2015 and nearly triple to 8.6 trillion, 8 trillion cubic feet in 2020, implying a 10 per 10 percent annual growth rate for the balance of the decade. Coal bed methane and shale gas are hoped each to, con to contribute 5 to 10 percent of the natural gas supply in 10 years' time. As late as 2006, China was self-sufficient in natural gas. However, the country has been a net importer since then, with imports soaring to 550 billion cubic feet in 2010. Our forecast calls for imports of 1.5 trillion cubic feet by 2015, rising to 4 trillion cubic feet by 2020, representing an import dependence of more than 30 percent by that time. Indeed, by the end of the decade, China may import more than total consumption today. China has three leading options for the import of natural gas, Central Asia, Russia, and LNG shipments. Overall, China's natural gas import prospects look promising from a diversity of sources, each with substantial supply capacity. The Chinese oil and gas sector comprises essentially three companies, Sinopec, PetroChina, and Sinook. Sinopec and PetroChina operate primarily in onshore fields and have refining and distribution operations. Sinook specializes in offshore oil and gas exploration and production, although it has diversified recently. All three Chinese majors are medium to large-sized oil companies and have a combined market capitalization of about $450 billion. That's about the market cap of Exxon. PetroChina, the largest of the three, has about the same capitalization as General Electric. The shares of all three companies are listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and the companies provide standard disclosures in English as required by the SEC. Our analysis suggests that Chinese oil majors act much like other companies to maximize revenues and profits, to gain exposure to growth plays like shale gas, to partner with other oil companies to obtain capital and, te and technical knowledge, and to diversify their portfolios to manage risk. We believe they do not represent a material risk on the supply side, but China's oil demand will likely keep pressures on oil prices for the indefinite future. I thank you for your attention and we'll try to answer any questions. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Kopitz. Mr. Palmer, you're recognized for five minutes. 
Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. It's a delight for me to be here. It's a high honor and deep privilege. I'm, I'm here to talk to you today about the growing use of coal around the world to fuel the second industrial revolution now underway in the developing world, particularly in Asia and led by China. I am chairman of the World Coal Association, the global voice of coal for international producers from the United States, Australia, South Africa, India, China, Europe, and Indonesia. Shenhua, a state-owned enterprise in the People's Republic of China and the largest coal producer in the world, recently joined World Coal Association. Coal India is also a member. World Coal Association regularly collaborates with trade associations or coal trade associations around the world, including the China National Coal Association, and I'm happy to say we will have our first board meeting ever in Beijing this June. I present this testimony today in my role as chairman of the World Coal Association. I am also senior vice president of government relations at Peabody Energy, the world's largest private sector coal company, and a global leader in clean coal solutions as an international coal producer in the United States and Australia. American other mature economies have a unique opportunity to create a 21st century energy policy through 21st century coal technology, following the lead of China-led Asia through the installation of state-of-the-art low-carbon coal technologies and what we call green coal. Energy is essential as food, shelter, and clothing. The United States has linked life expectancy and income with per capita energy use. The World Resources Institute found that with every tenfold increase in energy use, individuals live 10 years longer. Half the world's population, 3.6 billion people, lack adequate access to modern power. As many of you know, energy disparities are growing in your own districts. Studies show that today, today's middle class Americans pay a disproportionate amount of their after-tax income on energy, and it is due with respect to what we believe is a flawed energy policy in the United States. This energy inequality will only escalate as populations multiply and electricity use increases. The world is in the early stages of global hypergrowth in energy demand as nations such as China, India, and Indonesia industrialize and urbanize. <clears throat> the International Energy Agency projects that nations will require 40 percent more energy in the next quarter century. century. We believe coal is the only fuel with a low cost and large scale to satisfy this long-term need. Alt alternatives to coal are limited, strained, or centered in political flashpoints. Coal is widely dispersed, broadly available, easily transported, energy dense, and very affordable. In the U.S., the delivered cost of coal has averaged just, average just one-half to one-sixth that of more volatile natural gas. Oil hovers around $100 a barrel, and new nuclear construction brings unique risks, both physical and financial. By contrast, the world has trillions of tons of coal resources. That is why coal has been the fastest growing fuel in the world for the last decade, reaching about 6.5 billion tons of coal consumption per year in 2010. Coal is the catalyst for economic growth in the last 20 years has almost doubled with an increase of about 3 billion tons of coal per year. We know it can and will be a low cost, low carbon path for our, our environmental object, objectives. Of course, we have choices in the United States. We can, com we can pursue complex and punitive regulations through the EPA with unintended consequences. Or we can build advanced coal technologies that are available, affordable, and deployable today. Coal technologies in our country have always met environmental objectives. In the U.S., electricity from coal and GDP have more than tripled since 1970. At the same time, criteria emissions per megawatt hour declined more than 80 percent, according to the EPA. Today's efficient plants achieve a CO2 emission rate that is typically 15 percent better than the existing fleet and as much as 40 percent better than the older plants. The world's leading economies have taken notice, and China models itself and patterns itself in their infrastructure and energy development after the United States. There are some 430 gigawatts of supercritical and ultra-supercritical power plants in operation or under construction worldwide. China's coal consumption in the last 10 years has more than doubled to 3.5 billion tons in 2011, as the chairman noted. China alone is home to 36 percent of the world's most advanced coal fleet, and the growth of coal use will approach 
uh, 4.5 billion tons per year by 2015. That's up from about a billion, a billion tons from here in five years or one U.S. China is investing in clean energy technologies on an unprecedented scale, as you will hear, and Peabody is part of this revolution, advancing the next generation of clean coal technologies. Chief among these is the Green Gen Project near Tianjin, China, one of the world's largest near-zero emission initiatives, and Peabody is a partner in that. Peabody, in fact, is the only non-state-owned enterprise partner in Green Gen. We also are advancing green coal projects and partnerships on three co continents. While the developing world is investing in energy innovation, the U.S. is still debating options. My question to the subcommittee is simple and respectful. What are we waiting for? Advanced coal in the U.S. will combat energy poverty and fuel an industrial rebirth. The U.S. should set a national goal to ensure at least half of all new generation is fueled by coal and next generation clean coal technologies are demonstrated and commercialized. These technologies should include coal for electricity generation, coal to natural gas, coal to liquids, coal to chemicals, and CO2 from combustion or gasification of coal for a robust enhanced oil recovery program primarily for the Gulf states and the Rocky Mountain West. Nettle says we can do two and a half million barrels per day. This is the path for the People's Republic of China. It should be our path as well. Mr. <laughs> Chairman, we appreciate the opportunity to appear in front of you today. We believe strongly that coal alone has the power to address energy inequality, reindustrialize our economy, and improve the environment. Coal is energy, and energy is life. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Siegelson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Whitfield and members of the committee for inviting me to testify here today. My name is Deborah Seligson, and I'm senior advisor to the World Resources Institute's Climate and Energy Program based in Beijing. We have an active program with Chinese partners working on China's energy policy and transformation. I joined WRI three and a half years ago, coming from the U.S. Department of State, where I was in the Foreign Service for 21 years, with over a decade at the U.S. Mission in China, completing my work there as the U.S. Ambassador's Science Counselor in Beijing. In my time in China, which began actually in 1984, I've seen an incredible transformation in Chinese life and Chinese society. Riding my bicycle through the streets of Beijing in 1984, I was often showered in coal dust, and the city was dark. The sidewalks basically rolled up by 8 o'clock at night. I think you all know, either from seeing China firsthand or from reports and television, that China and Beijing are very different today with world-class subways, the largest um, intercity rapid rail transport in the world, booming industrialization and urbanization. This has really changed the perspective in China and what people want from their country, from their community, and from their energy policy. I want to present to you today three ideas that perhaps challenge some of the conventional wisdom about Chinese energy policy. The first is that the Chinese are doing what they're doing on energy transformation because they're concerned about energy security and about their economic future. Secondly, China's energy policy will have the result of curbing fossil fuel use over time and expanding the use of multiple alternative sources. And finally, China is doing this because they see it as a real opportunity to dominate in a new industrial area. So turning to my first point, energy security has always been very important to China. As a number of people have already noted, China is very dependent on imported oil. It's also dependent on trying to move coal around the country, which can be difficult, especially in snowstorms and dealing with rail capacity. As a re China today is less than 10 percent of the global oil market, and they're already concerned about the impact on relations with other countries and on that economic impact. But going beyond this traditional energy security concern, China is now concerned about what its future economy will look like. And it sees energy policy as part of the way to drive the economy in a, tr in a transformation from heavy industry to higher value added, more knowledge based, more service oriented economy. It's looking at these things by working on energy efficiency through its energy intensity targets, trying to reduce the amount of energy use per unit GDP, and by developing its non-fossil energy sources of all kinds. 
the, if you walk around in China, no one thinks there's room for U.S. levels of consumption. The country is simply too dense and crowded. There's no room for all of that energy, all those cars or roads. And that's why they're really looking at trying to create a much more efficient country for addressing some of these issues. Secondly, um, the way they're doing that is by really trying to curb fossil fuel growth and expand alternatives. They're promoting this transformation through policy mandates at the national and local level. Now, I'm not trying to present you with a naive idea that China is trying to abandon coal overnight. While it's true that China has, is building coal plants now every two weeks, remember that four years ago it was two plants a week. So that's a rather <coughs> rapid change. Efficiency is improving. They have the largest wind capacity in the world, and they're looking to have the largest um, nuclear capacity by 2020. Finally, they're doing this because they see it as an opportunity. China missed the Industrial Revolution. It was late to the IT revolution. And they see this new clean energy revolution as one where they can be first and they can do very, very well. If you think about an area like electric vehicles, China sees this as a solution to its imported oil dependence and a way to domesticate its vehicle fleet. It also sees other countries as fairly late to the table in this area and a real opportunity. We've talked about its leading wind and solar industries. They're looking now at whether they should perhaps be doubling their solar goal again in this five-year plan. They're leading in carbon capture and storage for a time when they may need to control the carbon emissions from coal. So they're looking across the board. But in conclusion, let me suggest that while China sees energy policy as critical to its economic future and it wants to dominate this global industry, this is not a game where the U.S. Can be, is going to be left out unless we choose to. This is a game where we can win. We are a world technology leader. We have the skills and the innovation hub to do it. The question is, do we have the supporting policies to make that possible here at home? And that's what's really going to make the difference. What kind of market do we create in the United States? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hutzler, you're recognized for five minutes. Okay. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you to discuss China's energy portfolio. I'm a senior fellow with the Institute for Energy Research, a nonprofit organization that conducts historical research and evaluates public policies in energy markets. Secretary Chu and other officials tell us the U.S. is losing the race with China regarding clean energy. That is a very narrow picture of the energy situation in China. China is not leading a clean energy revolution, but instead is leading a global race for all fuels, to fuel an economy growing at 7 to 9 percent per year, and to provide a better life for its people. China has a goal of producing 15 percent of its primary en energy consumption, from carbon-free energy by 2020. It expects to meet that goal primarily with hydroelectric and nuclear technologies because non-hydro renewables, mainly wind and solar, supply only a small amount of energy on a primary consumption basis. China is planning on hydroelectric power to supply 9 to 10 percentage points of its 15 percent goal by reaching a capacity level of 300 gigawatts, about 50 percent more than it has today. At the pace China is adding hydroelectric capacity, it will have no trouble exceeding that goal by 2020. It currently has twice the amount of hydroelectric capacity that the U.S. has and will have almost four times as much once it reaches its goal. China is expecting nuclear power to contribute up to six percentage points towards its 15 percent goal in 2020. China has 13 nuclear reactors operating and at least 25 reactors under construction half of the units in the world's construction pipeline. Official China nuclear capacity projections are 70 to 80 gigawatts by 2020 and 400 to 500 gigawatts of nuclear by 2050. If China meets its 2030 target of 200 gigawatts, it will have twice the amount of nuclear capacity as the U.S. The U.S. has not issued a construction permit for a new nuclear plant since 1979. China's goal for wind in 2020 is 150 gigawatts, and it's almost one-third of the way there. As Mr. Waxman has noted, China now has more installed wind power than any country in the world. But the U.S. is a close second. And because China's wind capacity is not all connected to the grid, the U.S. is 30 percent more usable wind capacity than China. China has one-fourth the solar capacity of the U.S., 
and generates a mere one one hundredth of a percent of its electricity from solar. Though China does not have much solar capacity, it leads the world in solar cell manufacturing, exporting 95 percent of its production. Because manufacturing costs are lower in China, some U.S. solar manufacturers are moving there. Part of China's goal is to be self-sustaining in energy technology, and it is learning from U.S. experts in solar energy, nuclear power, and other technologies. For example, China has a goal to enter the global nuclear marketplace by 2013, just a few years from now. China relies on coal for over 70 percent of its energy and over 80 percent of its electricity. The U.S. relies on coal for 21 percent of its energy and 45 percent of its electricity. According to the Energy Information Administration, China will be heavily reliant on coal 25 years from now, generating 74 percent of its electricity from it. With its massive coal use, China will be emitting more carbon dioxide emissions than any country in the world, over 30 percent of the world's total in 2035, and twice the amount the U.S. is expected to emit. China passed the U.S. in CO2 emissions years ago and recently in energy use. In summary, the Chinese are not fixated solely on green technology. China is on a fast track to bring online new generating units of all types. Because China is endowed with a sizable amount of coal resources and because coal is the cheapest energy source in China, coal-fired generating additions will far outpace those of other technologies. Thank you. I will be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Ms. Hustler, and thank you all for your testimony. Uh, we appreciate it very much. Uh, Mr. Palmer, I believe you said that world energy demands will increase by 40 percent by the what year? Uh, 2030, 2030. 2030. Now, in my view, it's impossible for the world to have any chance of meeting its electricity demands without using coal any time in the near future. Would, would you agree with that, Mr. Kopitz? I would agree. Mr. Palmer? As certain as the lights in this room. Ms. Seligson? There are technical ways, but it seems unlikely that that will be the choice that yeah. people make. Ms. Hutzler? Yes, please. Okay. Now, one of the things that I'm concerned about is we all recognize with that kind of increase in demand, we, all, we, we are going to have to have energy from all sources. <clears throat> but I genuinely believe that this administration is adopting a policy to uh, penalize uh, fossil fuels. That, that's my belief. Uh, just from the action being taken at EPA, particularly when you consider how clean our air already is compared to the rest of the world. It looks like we are adopting a policy to penalize fossil fuel. And I'm concerned about that because of the increased cost of producing electricity and for us to remain competitive in the global marketplace as we try to seek jobs and to grow our economy. Now, Ms. Hutzler, We've heard a lot about China's moving forward, making great strides in wind power and solar power. And, uh, but even so, my understanding is that the U.S. over the last few years has actually produced more wind power and solar power than, than China, particularly if it's connected to the grid. Would you agree with that? Oh, okay. Certainly in terms of grid connected yeah. capacity. And, and of all have. the wind power that they're uh, building, how much of it, it's my understanding like 30 percent of it's not connected to the grid. That's my understanding okay. also. Can I clarify that? Sure. Basically, China doubles its wind capacity every year. And so it's always running behind on connecting okay. it to the grid. So they were six months behind a couple years ago. They're now about four months behind. So they're okay. catching up. It gets connected okay. to the grid. It just runs late. Okay, thank you. Now, the thing that really disturbs me about their development of wind power, and I may be wrong on this, but it's my understanding that under the Kyoto Protocol, there was a clean development mechanism established so that countries from around the world, like the U.S., and other countries, their taxpayers would pay into this fund and that other countries would be able to utilize that fund to develop wind power, solar power that would not be built without that fund. And so China 
who has one of the strongest economic engines out there in the world, is, is taking taxpayer dollars from Americans to build wind power and solar power in China through this fund. Is that correct, Ms. Hutzler, or not? Yes, my understanding is that's the way that China started their wind um, program. So, but so the U.S. taxpayers are subsidizing China's development in wind that many people in this country are applauding China for doing. Is that correct? That's correct in terms of them getting off the shelf in terms of building wind, wind power, yes. But from my understanding, the UN has recognized that they were lowering their subsidies, and that was why they were qualifying for the program, and mm -hmm. that has stopped at this point. And then I read an article, I guess just in the last few days, that the World Bank is going to limit funding for coal-fired power stations, and it says primarily bowing to pressure from green campaigners <coughs> to radically revise its rules that the World Bank is planning to restrict money for coal-fired power stations. Now, I'd like for somebody to explain how are we going to meet our electricity demands worldwide if we're going to stop funding coal-powered plants. Mr. Chairman, if I might. Yes. I think the World Bank ought to be careful what it asks for because there's a bank called the Asian Development Bank, and like everything else in Asia, with the growth of wealth there, the World Bank over time will become irrelevant if it gets out of the business of, of funding developing nation fossil projects because there will be Asian banks that will absolutely do that. So it is absolutely in our interest, the World Bank's interest, to continue as a World Bank to be, to be funding these projects. The projects will, absol will absolutely go ahead because the demand is there and the resources are there and, uh, and these, these uh, international entities that have been created in Asia through ASEAN and, and uh, other entities will, will supplant the United States and the uh, OECD countries in terms of world leadership uh, with the developing world. No question. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Palmer. My time's expired. I recognize the gentleman from Illinois for five minutes. Uh, Ms. Ellison, uh, your facial expression really uh, indicated that you wanted to answer the question that the chairman asked Ms. Hustler and you didn't have an opportunity. Would you like expound upon that? Yeah, the United States is not a party to the Kyoto Protocol, and the Clean Development Mechanism is under the Kyoto Protocol. So um, no U.S. money goes through the Clean Development Mechanism. And the money basically comes from private investors in Kyoto party nations, like in Europe, who choose to get some of their emissions credits through um, this clean development me mechanism by investing in countries like China or India or African countries, developing countries around the world. Um, the other thing I wanted to clarify is um, the World Bank isn't really needed for investing in coal-fired power plants in China. There's plenty of commercial money for investing in new power plants in countries like China. Both the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank are quite interested in working with the Chinese to invest in carbon capture and storage technology and in those next generation coal-fired power plants that would enable the Chinese to produce low emissions or zero emissions um, coal-fired power plants. So there is a lot of interest in, in that area among the international banks. But the idea of those banks is to promote the kinds of things that private sector banks don't promote already. <clears throat> well, okay. thank you. I understand that you, uh, that you live in China or have lived in China for a number of years. I've lived in China for 17 of the last 27 years. 17 of the last 27 years. And in your pre prepared remarks, you make the observation that international partnerships with Chinese clean technology companies are growing rapidly. And you go on to say that what makes China uh, so attractive to U.S. and international investors is a clear, clear policy framework that gives businesses the certainty, certainty that they're looking for before investing. Can you expound on this observation and talk about how the political climate in China where policymakers are actually engaging in short and long-term comprehensive policy decisions, making investment more enticing than the environment that we have here uh, in the U.S. with a lack of congressional uh, leadership? Does the certainty that stems from a clear policy framework make it easier to attract uh, foreign investment or domestic investment or both for clean energy technology in China? 
Yes, sir. I think one thing that all of us would agree on is that building a new power plant or a refinery or any other kind of energy infrastructure takes a number of years. And so the Chinese have a five-year planning process that sets out clear goals for the next five years in terms of percentages of different um, fuel sources and what kinds of new policies they might be introducing, everything from energy service companies to new energy efficiency guidelines. They also have medium and long-term goals. They have a medium and long-term science research and science plan. They have energy plans. They also have a renewable energy law that provides clear guidelines as well as targets. So the net result of all of this is that, yes, companies, both domestic and foreign, know what the policy picture is, know which kinds of energy projects are going to be supported over a number of years. Of course, there's also a certain amount of change from year to year. One of the changes that's happened is, for example, in the wind area, wind has grown much more quickly than policymakers imagined even four or five years ago. And so they've actually increased the goals a number of times. But there are a number of supported policies, and they tend to stay for a number of years, whereas, as you know, in the United States, um, new energy developers have worried about tax breaks coming and going and that kind of thing. And it's worth noting that in the United States, 70 percent of all energy subsidies are to fossil fuels. On their 12th five-year plan to reduce energy in intensity, sulfur dioxide and uh, chemical oxygen uh, demand, or COD. Uh, can you tell the subcommittee if the Chinese have been successful in meeting these goals set forth in their reduction plans? Have they fallen short, met their expectations, or exceeded their expectations? And how have the Chinese, uh, have, how have the Chinese been so successful if they met this goal? How have they met these goals? The Chinese almost met the goal for energy intensity. They got 19.1 percent, and the goal was 20 percent. It's a good sign that they were so clear about being just shy of the goal rather than trying to sort of meet it. Um, they actually exceeded both the sulfur dioxide and the COD goals in the last five-year plan. The 10 percent goals were exceeded by both. And that was an extraordinary victory for the Ministry of Environmental Protection, which is China's newest ministry. It was only reached ministry status in 2007. In earlier years, they'd had much more trouble enforcing their um, environmental targets. And this really reflects a change in Chinese society and in Chinese government in just the last five years on, in focusing much more closely on these types of environmental goals. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Terry, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so look, um, First of all, I want to say that uh, I'm impressed with China's measures. Uh, I'm impressed with the amount of electrical generation that they've been able to bring on rather quickly. Um, since uh, pollution is a global issue, I'm pleased that they're taking measures to reduce it. Um, I just want to make sure uh, as we discuss and, and we put China up on a pedestal that we're, we're looking or comparing apples to apples here. And so um, forgive me if I, uh, Seligson, did I say that right? Seligson. Seligson, very good. I'm pro Deborah, yeah. When we talk about China meeting their goals uh, for NOx and SOx and all of these, uh, the particulates that we have uh, already in our Clean Air Act, would you, it would probably, I don't want you to itemize, but would you su uh, supply to this committee a side by side of what China's uh, particulate <laughs> regulations are to the United States? Because I want to see how they can compare. And, yeah, and we would have to get that to you. I would appreciate it. It's worth noting that us, uh, Knox, for really example, look. only comes in as a goal in this next five years. Well, all, all of all the particulates, right. that particularly right. from electrical generation. No, well, my point is it's a work in progress. They're definitely well, and my point us. is we're not dealing with apples to apples, and I'd, I'd like to know uh, because I think it's unfair to have this discussion in generalities instead of specifics. Uh, the other uh, question is, I'm impressed with China's portfolio. 
Uh, in fact, that's part of the battles that we've had on this committee with past. I'm embarrassed that we don't have a long-term energy policy, but then we haven't been able to use hydro, and China has a 22 gigawatt on the Yangtze River. That's impressive. But we can't do that in the United States because of environmental policies. Uh, we want to do coal and clean coal technologies, but any use of coal or mention of coal, my gosh, you think that uh, you are pillaging. Uh, and so we can't use coal or even clean coal technology. So, Deb, once again, you had, you had mentioned in a very positive way uh, the coal uh, gasification, capture, sequestration, zero emission coal fire plants that China's building. I want to do that too. But we can't seem to get it off the ground here. Uh, the Obama administration, uh, this administration, there's been a next gen sitting on the books for years, but Bush didn't go forward with it because of environmental. And now our current president isn't going forward with it. So what's China doing that we can't do here? Uh, and then, uh, well, let's go with that question real quick. How, how can they build it so quickly over there and, and we can't even get a pilot project off of the ground? There definitely is more of a policy consensus in China on the importance of um, developing new coal technologies for their portfolio. I think there, there are arguments on both sides here in the United States. There are people who really believe that yeah. it is going to be part of it, and there are people who recognize the enormous renewable resources we have. We do have more renewable resources than China does in terms of availability We're allowed to of use wind it. and solar. In, in regard to um, building plants, how does China compare with uh, environmental impact studies, permitting processes? So they're, they're more streamlined. I mean, China has an EIA process. It has a permitting process, but it's definitely more rapid. Do they also the have States. a right of citizen lawsuits, for example, when a wind project uh, is designed in the sand hills of Nebraska or a pipeline and then citizens sue and stop the project? Does China have that right? They do not. Well, I'm not asking you. <laughs> uh, I'll is. try and say I, th I'm going to assume citizen, that the answer is no. citizen suit rights. I, I can get you no. more. Does China have citizen They have suits. citizen suits for certain kind of things like pollution, and I would have to get back can to you with a specific range. Can they stop a project? Because that's part of our problem with even wind and solar projects. The environmental groups sue them. I don't know whether it's, it's legally conceivable. Well, then I I'll go to. I do know that it's uh, unusual for it to happen. Uh, Appreciate that. Does somebody else want the last 13 seconds? I, I would just like to, to say on that, the process goes through the, uh, uh, the NEA, the National Energy Administration, and the NDRC, the National Development Resource Commission, and it's a, it is a, an application grant project. There is very, I, I've seen, we're, we, Peabody is active in China in a major way. I've seen no evidence of citizen activity in that process <laughs> at all. Mr. It's, I, my time's up, but. Mr. Maybe Waxman, we were recognized for five Waxman minutes. Maybe could ask you, uh, Ms. Hutzler. You you heard Mrs. Ms. Seligson's answer, which was contradictory to yours, about this bank funding Chinese activities and whether U.S. taxpayers are contributing to it. She said that we're not because we never ratified the Kyoto Protocol. Do you do you agree with her? Uh, yes, I do agree with what she said. It's, but it is true that developed nations get credits for the Clean Development Program, and that's how China started with their wind program. But the United States is not one of those developed nations. That's correct. Okay, so your answer to the chairman was not correct because his, his question was, are American taxpayers subsidizing these activities in China? And the answer should have been no. Isn't that right? Yes. Okay. Um, we, uh, we, the chairman said something that, uh, that uh, the government has policies that penalize coal. What policies does the U.S. government have that penalizes coal? Correct. Mr. Palmer? There, there's a great controversy right now, uh, Congressman, over, over the Environmental Protection Agency's proposed rules for 
particulate emissions from coal plants and uh, also greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. Do you think those were set in place to penalize coal or to protect the public health from particulates which can be a danger to? Mike Morris, health? who's the chairman of AEP, analogized it this way. He said if you took, a, if you took the convention center in Washington, D.C. and filled it with ping pong balls, what, what EPA is trying to do is take out one ping pong ball and we have done. In other words, the I'm, EPA I'm does. I'm not finished, Congressman. Yeah, but I want to ask you this. <laughs> I'm going to finish my, my answer. No, it's my time, and you'll answer my questions. Okay. And my question is this. Uh, is the EPA not going against other sources of particulate matter? The, the And only going after one? I gather the ping pong they're going after is the coal ping pong. The studies is that, have is seen that a fair connection statement? with the coal plants would result in a 15 to 20 percent increase in electricity rates in the heartland of the United States, damaging manufacturing, lost employment, and hurting people in their Is there homes. another way we can reduce the particulate matter? <clears throat> well, or should we ignore the harm it does to public health? Well, first of all, Ms. Uh, Congressman, Clean coal, the, the issue of harm to public health is contradicted by a recent figures that came out last week that show more people living better, living longer in the United States, even as coal use has, coal consumption has. You're really not years. an expert on public health. You are a representative of the coal industry. I would submit to you and to anybody watching this that the U.S. EPA has an obligation to deal with particulate matters which get into the lungs and can cause disease, whatever the source may be. So I don't think it's particularly singling out the coal industry when the EPA says that they want some, uh, some technology that's already available, the best to control technology, to be used. But I, I, it's interesting. I haven't heard in these discussions the idea that, um, that China's not doing anything. That's what we usually hear. China's not doing anything, so why should we? Uh, Ms. Seligson, you, you testify China has a five-year plan that actually calls for a number of significant actions to address carbon emissions. If this plan is implemented, will China be on track to meet its commitments under the Copenhagen Accord? Yeah, actually, he'll, it'll be ahead of the curve. It, it'll be more than two-thirds of the way to the commitments they made for 2020. Now, how, how should, why should we believe them? Did they, have they met their targets they set in their previous uh, five-year plan? They came quite close on some, and they exceeded on others. Uh, some of their energy policies appear to be quite aggressive. Is it true that China has shut down over 70,000 megawatts of old, inefficient coal plants during the last five years and replaced those plants with newer, more efficient coal plants? Yes. And now China's planning pilot programs involving cap and trade and carbon taxes? They're actively talking about it, and both were listed in the party's document re about the five-year plan. So it seems likely that we'll see them in the next five years. Now, is China uninterested in jobs and economic growth? Is it safe to conclude that uh, they would uh, be adopting all of these climate and energy policies if they were killing jobs and slowing China's economic growth? I think it's safe to say that they don't think so, that the wealthiest areas of China are the areas that face the highest energy prices, not the lowest energy prices, and that they think that transforming to a much higher value-added society and not depending on heavy, dirty industry is part of their future. I want to uh, add my voice to all the members of the panel. I think we're going to continue to c use coal for the foreseeable future. But we shouldn't use coal uh, if we can get it uh, to pollute less. Uh, if we can get cleaner coal, that would be great for this country and for the, the world. And we shouldn't put all of our baskets in coal, because if we can develop alternatives in supplementing energy from coal, uh, we have a chance to reduce some of these carbon emissions. Yield back my time. Uh, Mr. Bilbray, you recognize five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, Deborah, you wanted to answer a question to this guy, and he cut you off. Um, the issue about were you trying to say when you, we were talking about the citizen litigation against that, it hasn't happened, um, but it could pot theoretically in the future? I would need to actually go check with an environmental lawyer. There are areas where there's actually limited citizen litigation. It's a very different system than ours. And so, but, there, but it isn't simply the NDRC and NEA. There's permitting from the lands ministry, the environmental protection right. ministry. The big, big issue, though, is the private action of where people actually can make money by litigating. They're, 
Um, there have been a number of dams blocked by citizen protest, and then, you know, Premier Wen Jiabao has actually... But what I'm saying is, is that that protest here. was actually grassroots, but it was not Correct. somebody suing and basically taking an action and then actually being able to make a living off of these, you know, you don't have lawyers making, um, you know, you don't have large corporate firms that specialize in blocking these projects. Is that fair to say? It, it's fair to say the Chinese legal profession. Okay. I'm impressed. Limited. I'm very impressed with a five-year plan concept. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just tell you for a fact, you could not do, you know, I've, I've done methane recovery systems on landfills. You can't even get the environmental impact reports done in this country in five years. Mm -hmm. um, so it is really exciting to hear about a country that actually can have implementation plans in five years. And how long did it take? does it take to hook to the grid or to get the lines from the grid over to these, these wind, wind generators? Well, they, they generally run about four months behind, so they may be completed and it may take another four months to connect. They had a problem with connections in remote rural areas, and they put in an, an additional fund last year to build more rural And how long would, lines. The, would they take from the time that the, somebody asked for it to the time that it, or but the time that somebody decides in government to build it and it actually ends up hooking up? Well, What's it's it? pretty quick. How fast? I, I would have to check to get you a number. I mean, what I can say is the average grid connection is four months after completion. Okay, of the I appreciate that. I mean, San Diego County with three million people have been trying for 20 years to get another grid connection so that we we could hook up to the outline areas. We, you know, we're trying to hook up to solar now out in the deserts. The trouble is getting the permits. So I think we're really on a big issue that the fact is um, China um, does not have um, the gauntlet that we have in this where um, the huge gap between the concept of implementation and the completion or just getting a permit, um, you know, there is a totally different world here that we need to talk about. If, uh, let me just say this. Would you agree that if we're going to be as aggressive with this broad portfolio as China, those of us in government have to take a look at how we're managing our procedures to be able to make that possible in a timely manner? Yes, but there are a number of other countries like Germany, Denmark, that we can look at for ideas. It's not that China, with all of its other governance pro problems, is going to be the model for how to address all of these issues. But then again, then, then again, Germany doesn't have nuke, but it buys its, nu its energy from the nuclear power plants in France, right? Um, I'm not actually sure about that, but I, I'm just saying there are a number of European countries, including France, that deal with okay. these questions within a different I know it, and including France has proven that we can recycle and do a lot of other things. But China is the one we're really focusing on here, and that is where I just want to, uh, want to point out that we have some major, major differences between the regulatory structure in the United States and the regulatory structure in China. That's fair to say? That's absolutely fair to say. Do you think that their streamlined regulatory structure has been a major contributor to their ability to be so aggressive at developing a broad spectrum of nuclear, I mean, of, of energy technologies? I think it's been one way, but if you look at the Danes and wind and other countries, there are ways to do it with more protection. But the Danes, you know, but what I'm saying is you're talking one over here, one over here. We're talking about, we keep talking about that broad uh, portfolio where you don't just pick one technology you're drawing at all and that that seems to go into it. Mr. Palmer you were uh, do you know if we have any uh, nuclear I mean any coal plants left in California? Uh, California buys coal uh, I think there may be a couple of very small units but coal-based electricity operating but you're I just think you're so right correct in terms of identifying the regulatory morass in the United States and getting something built. Certainly, certainly you can't do it in California. I think Richmond was our last coal <coughs> fire plant. I mean, well, in all fairness, I think you go to jail if you burn coal in California. Well, so you have to meet a natural gas standard, well, which is to say you have to have carbon capture and storage, and, and that's... I developed. really look forward to that. I mean, I'll tell you, uh, with our state, we actually developed the technology and the genetic uh, research that um, allowed us to develop alternative fuels like algae. But our scientists at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in the University of California, San Diego, had to leave the state to go into production because you couldn't get a permit, um, not in five years, you couldn't get a permit in California in 10 years. <laughs> let okay? Me, let so me. Uh, believe me, California, we understand the challenge. So let thank me you very much. Just one point, and that is 
China may not be a model. I know what isn't a model. The state of California is no model. Thank you. Mr. Green, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me take a different uh, line of questioning, I guess, because I'm amazed that we're talking about how great China is and trying to compare it to our system. Um, do they have trial by jury in China? No. Freedom of speech? No. You know, uh, freedom is expensive. <laughs> and we may not have the lawsuit, they may not have the lawsuits we have, uh, but at least we go to court instead of having to protest down at the local dam and threatening to overthrow or, or kill the local province officials for building that dam. Is that what typically happens? Is that the way the Chinese can protest a particular plant being built or the expropriation of their land they've lived on for generations, actually owned by the government? Is that how it works? Their, their protests, I, they don't usually involve threatening to kill anybody. Well, I, I've heard other things, but, uh, but that's their avenue to get the attention of their government. They can't go to the courthouse and sue their government. As I said, there are areas where they can, and there's, certain envir there's actually been some quite successful environmental lawsuits. There's also a growing effort to, d to um, use public hearings in China. There's also a system of petitions. Um, but it's a work in progress, and the Chinese would be the first to say that they're trying to improve their governance in this area, it's not that they have a perfect system. Well, and I'm not, but obviously we don't have a perfect system, but I think if you have a command economy, you lose a lot of freedoms that I think both sides of the aisle we would enjoy, and we enjoy in our country. So I think comparing how Chinese make a decision, that may work in China, but it really doesn't work with the history we have in our country since 1776. And uh, so I think holding us up to, they're a command economy. If the leadership in China is sold on a certain idea, that's what they do. Is that correct? It's more complicated than that because it's, it's, there are lots of different interests and the companies are separate from government and there's a lot of negotiation that well, goes on. Well, I know some of the but companies they do are have not an separate easier from time. State-owned enterprises are separate from government ministries and they do rival with each other quite a lot, actually. Well, I guess it's, uh, you know, a free enterprise economy, which is truly free enterprise and not controlled free enterprise. And I guess that's what bothers me. I, uh, Ms. Hustler, this chart that you put up from the Energy Administration Institute um, or administration, and I was a business major and went to law school, so I have to admit numbers kind of sometimes get in the way. But I don't see how in 2007 they produced a little over 3,000 bill of kilowatt hours. In 2035, they plan to tr over triple their kilowatt hours with reducing their coal by only 6% and uh, going from 2 to 6% nuclear. They're actually going to reduce their natural gas, reduce their coal, uh, reduce their hydro, uh, go from 0 to 4 in wind power and 0 to 3 in biomass. Seems like they're... The, the expansion is actually in things that we know we want. We want wind, we want solar, we want biomass. But I wish I could tell you we're going to ever be able to turn on the lights in this room uh, with wind, solar, and biomass. So I don't know. I'm, I'm going to find out where these numbers come from because I think uh, some of them are questionable because it just doesn't seem like it adds up that they can all over triple their kilowatt hours by <laughs> reducing from the traditional sources, whether it's coal or natural gas, and even only tripling their nuclear power, because now they only have 2% nuclear power, and they're going to 6%. Do you know how much nuclear power our country produces? And we haven't built a plant since the 80s. I think we only produce about, what, 20%, 22%? That's about right, yeah. 20%. So even at 22%, we're way far ahead of China is right now. That's nuclear right. Power. Yes. Um, I know China, uh, they have some natural gas from around the Sion area, because I was there a number of years ago, but they were pretty inefficient. I don't know if they've uh, discovered additional natural gas that's domestically. I know they're buying a lot of it. In fact, they're bidding up the price around the world. I also know they're buying coal. Can China produce enough domestic coal to generate? No. Uh, they, have the, uh, the, they are now a major coal importer, yeah. and that is, and that is that is new. Uh, they, there was a time about seven or eight years ago when the fear in the seaborne market was that 
China exports would swamp, but they're very opportunistic. Well, and I'm almost out of time. Let me ask something. Those plants that China's building that are new coal plants, we know we build coal plants today much cleaner and better than we did 30 years ago. What are they doing? Are we just not replacing our coal plants? Yes, that's correct. They're building supercritical plants at a very fast pace, but we're building coal plants at a very slow pace, if at all. Um, we, we've built more in 2010 than since 1985, but then it's only about six gigawatts. They build 10 times as much as what we do in a well, year. And Mr. Chairman, I'll close by saying, I guess if the president and his cabinet could decide they're gonna build a coal plant in my area and not have to go through any of the local regulations or anything like that, and even take the land that I own to do it, which sometimes you can, uh, but, but again, they're a very command economy as compared to a free enterprise and freedom economy that we are accustomed to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McKinley, you recognize five minutes. Mr. McKinley, you recognize five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Hustler, I've just a couple quick questions on thing. Um, can you compare the, the, the average wages for a Chinese uh, worker and an American miner? Uh, they're vastly different. The Chinese work for um, a mere fraction of what it costs. Both in the same sector and both in the mining and energy yes. production in China would be, I mean, I'm told as much as a factor of 10 to 15 times. I would believe so. Um, do, you have a, do you have a sense of how many um, families are dependent either directly or indirectly on uh, coal production in America? No, I don't have that number, but I can get it for you. Are you, have you seen that report um, that was uh, produced apparently by the EPA that said that of all the greenhouse gases were fully implemented uh, under the Clean Air Act, that the global temperature would drop, would only drop less than a tenth of one degree? Yes. Mm -hmm. and so do you, th from your viewpoint, is, is it worth all the expenditure and the distraction from our manufacturing and our base to spend that kind of money for a tenth of less than a tenth of a degree. From my viewpoint, no, it's not. Thank you. Um, maybe maybe the question was asked, but if I could try again, because uh, I didn't hear all the questions on it. Do you have a record, or, or someone published anything about the number of coal-fired, these supercritical facilities in China, or say over the last five years? Do we have a sense? I, I've heard as much as one a week. I've heard four a month or two a month. Is, is there some? Is there a reliable source of information on that? The source I use is the National Energy Technology Laboratory, and they're saying it's probably about one gigawatt um, a week which would be one or two plants, one if it's a, if it's a gigawatt, and two if it's 500 megawatts. And who provided that? The National Energy Technology Laboratory. Is that the, um, thank you for bringing that subject up. You're aware that the president's budget slashes their, their, their research by over $800 million on coal technology? No, I wasn't. Mm -mm. Yeah. For someone that we want to out-innovate, out-produce, we're going to slash the very thing that could create cheap. I, I'm just curious in, in that little bit of time. Uh, it just seems to me kind of self-evident with the Chinese uh, energy production, they have little environmental constraints on their water discharge, their greenhouse gases, their particular matter, their fly ash. Um, their wages are a fraction like you just pointed out. Um, their health care is poor. Their retirement pension plans are almost non-existent other than government run. Their monetary system is being subsidized. Why do, we, why do you think we keep using China as a poster child for energy? Well, probably because people would like to look at them as leading the clean energy race. But as I tried to point out, they're leading the race in all fuels. And they're doing that to make a better life for their citizens and to keep their economy growing at the fast pace that it's growing now. It's a detriment of their, their people. No, I think you need all fuels. Really? For certainly. Can you share with it? Because one of the issues we're facing here in, in, in America, obviously, is the issue of fly ash that the EPA is 
kind of knee-jerk reaction to a dam collapsing in Tennessee, and they want to uh, make it a, a hazardous material, treat it as a hazardous material. How does China treat its fly ash? Uh, I'm not an expert on that. Maybe Mr. Palmer might know. Since you spent 17 of your last 27 years, what, what are they doing with fly ash in China? I don't know. I'd have to check. I can get back to you. Okay. And if 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 we if if the production of, of power, if we're if we don't have the ability to recycle fly ash, what do you think would happen to the price of power in America? It would increase dramatically. Thank you. You'll back my time. Thank. You. Does the gentleman from Massachusetts seek recognition? Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, so, uh, Ms. Hutzler, um, we're really making tremendous um, gains in wind power in the United States. Huh? 27,000 new megawatts were installed in the last four years, and that's that's quite a number. Do you expect to see that growing dramatically in the years ahead? Yes, the Energy Information Administration sees uh, about half of the increase in capacity in renewable technologies to come from wind. So what do you think by 2020 we could have, if it's 27,000 in the last four years, what do you think we could see by uh, uh, 2020 in wind installed wind capacity? Mm, I don't think they're projecting that, e even though the increase is large, that it'll get more than 50 or 60 gigawatts. Additional gigawatts? No, that's total. Oh, so you're saying that... Uh, so it's only about... 20 gigawatts Only extra. 20, you mean, so you're saying we've already passed the peak in terms of new wind installation? Probably. Yeah. Um, well, I think you're 100 percent wrong on that. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and how about in solar? How do you see solar going? There was 1,000 new megawatts this year. The solar industry says it should be 1,500 this year. Uh, last year it was 1,000 new megawatts. 1,500 new megawatts this year will be installed, and they're predicting 2,000 megawatts next year. What, do you see that slowing down, too, after uh, next year? No. A actually, I, solar, they have increasing more, but that's because we have very little today. We only have about one gigawatt today. So do you think we can so, have, uh, well, there was one gigawatt so, installed in 2010. Right. But, but we, we have more than that. 1.3, something like that. It's yeah. not a hurt. So what do you amount. see by 2020, the installation for solar? Maybe another 10 gigawatts. 10 altogether? Yes. So, so you're saying that, that last year's pace, 1,000, will just be the same pace and it won't increase over the next 10 years? Well, I'm saying it's going to increase, but not no, at I'm saying the you same only rate. See one, you yes. only see 1,000 a year. Is that what you're saying? Actually less. You see mm -hmm. one, less than 1,000. Do you see the price of solar coming down over the next 10 years with the global uh, investment in China and other countries, or do you see it staying the same? It'll come down, but it's going to come down as a basis of what's being built. And even the Chinese feel that solar is more expensive than other technologies, actually, and they're actually, pushing Blo the non-solar ones. Actually, in a Bloomberg story here, China, the world's biggest energy consumer, will cut its 2020 target for nuclear power. This is a story from two days ago. Uh, nuclear power capacity and build more solar farms following Japan's atomic crisis, said an official at the National Development and, Farm and Reform Commission in Japan. Uh, it is going to uh, cut its uh, goal of 80,000 megawatts by 2020, uh, <clears throat> and instead it is going to dramatically increase its goal of 20,000 uh, megawatts of solar. It's going to dramatically increase its goal by uh, 2020 in China. So don't you think that the, the totality of all of the investment that's going to be made in China and Japan now and other countries is going to dramatically lower the price of solar, make it more competitive, and not have it just be a grand total of 1000 per year every year from now on, but maybe 2000 or 3000 You don't think that's going to happen? It has a long way to go. It's about three times as much as other technologies, and so even if, more if, than that if natural If the price gas. is cut in half, you still don't, if the price is cut in half, do you see any increase above your 1000 per year projection? There might be a slight increase, but it, it's going to be very difficult to get it down to that You're level. You're a very pessimistic person technologically, you know. It really, it's like talking to uh, maybe the owner of a typewriter company and 
1990 seeing no threats from computers over the next 20 years, so we're going to double our investment in, in typewriters because how can we ever have a th all people using computers only in 20 years because the, the price is just not competitive with Underwood typewriters, so I'm investing all my money in Underwood right now. And you can go through other industries, but you can have these revolutions very quickly, as you know, and, uh, <clears throat> and I just think that you are displaying an amazing amount of... Uh, let me say, you 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 just don't believe in the market system. I most uh, certainly and, do. Oh no, you don't. I do. You're, you're, you're projecting today, ten years from now, even though there's a global investment that's being made in wind and solar that's going to drop the price and make it much more likely that there's going to be an investment, even as the market has been moving away from coal uh, and moving in, towards to towards renewables and natural gas. I mean, natural gas and wind have been the largest single additions to our grid in the last four years. You agree with that? Yes. I I do. Yeah, but you see wind falling off and solar not contributing, uh, and uh, and do you see coal increasing going forward? Yes, but very little. Yeah, but it larger than larger than wind and solar. Uh, no, about the same. I would about say. About the same. So so you see. Um, you, you, you see uh, wind kind of slowing down to the pace at which new coal is being installed in the country. And, and I kind of disagree with you on that. Um, just looking at the market forces uh, over the last four or five years, uh, I mean, the, 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 the charts for wind and for solar and for natural gas are way up high, and for coal and for nuclear, nuclear is non-existent, uh, way down here. So the market has moved. Wall Street has moved. Private investors have moved. Uh, and they've moved globally, and, and the more that there is a doubling of the, of the in installed capacity across the planet, the more you're going to see it on the price. Gentlemen's times have expired, and the sure. chair will remind the gentleman that um, uh, we still are, as somebody who just uh, made a purchase of solar panels myself, we're yeah. still using monocrystal, which is the same technology we've had for 30 years. The price is modified, and that's great, and the thin film um, has major, a lot more technical problems than what people talk about, and still monocrystal is the, still the cutting edge, and the same thing that was when we were in school, and, it, and we started making those little kits. So hopefully we'll, um, we'll see the balance where, where, it's out, where it's appropriate, where it's down. Uh, the price, Mr. Chairman, the price has dropped precipitously from the time that we were kids. When no. we were kids, the price was $10 a and kilowatt the, and hour. And the fact is... It is now down into the 20 Absolutely. And, the cent. and that's that's all I'm talking about. I'm talking about this I will, uh, reduction in the price. I understand that. At San Diego, we have a major manufacturer of, of solar panels owned by the Chinese, um, uh, manufactured in the Chinese with, um, with, with their coal, and then uh, exported it and assembled in, in San Diego for the market that is basically being created by our, um, by our government regs and subsidies. So hopefully um, the gentleman from uh, Colorado, uh, Yuma, uh, might be able to enlighten us too about how maybe we uh, want to change our laws so people get on solar rather than having power lines required by government to be brought way out into the boonies of the, of the plains of, of Colorado. <laughs> but uh, I yield to the gentleman from Colorado at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the witnesses. Uh, thank you for your time and testimony today. Um, just a couple of, of points. I was reading an article recently in the Denver Post. It cited a, a author of a, a publication called Power Hungry. Uh, Robert Bryce, the author, reminded the audience that Americans get 140 times as much energy from coal, oil, and natural gas as they do from uh, clean energy sources such as wind and solar. Uh, is, that, is that an accurate statement? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see that changing dramatically in 20 years? Will it be 140? Will it be 100? Will it be five? It's, it'll change, but very little. So, you, so in, in 20 years from now, you're still saying that we will get about 140 times more energy from uh, traditional sources than uh, some of the new sources that have been talked about today? Yes. Thank you. Uh, and Ms. Hutzler, just to continue with our conversation, what lessons can the United States learn uh, from China's experience in constructing wind farms? And uh, to further that a little bit, specific question, under what geographic and engineering conditions is wind generation appropriate and beneficial? Well, I certainly believe that we need all technologies. The trouble with wind is that you have better sites. There are good resources versus more difficult resources. And so as you add on wind capacity, you eventually get to the point where it's going to cost you more because you've got sites that aren't as conducive in terms of uh, constructing the wind units. 
And do you see uh, land use problems in the United States affecting our ability to access good wind sites? More than likely. I mean, certainly with solar, we have people complaining about the massive land use issues there. So I imagine that will eventually happen with wind as well. And does China have an equivalent of like a United States Department of Interior that prohibits uh, the siting of certain uh, wind opportunities or transmission lines? Uh, I'm not an expert on China's government, so uh, maybe Deborah could answer that question. Uh, thank you. And just to, Mr. Palmer, to turn to you, what do you see as the biggest impediments in the United States to building new energy technologies, um, and not not new energy in the in the in the in the sometimes modern day acceptance, but just energy technologies overall? When you ask me, energy congressman, I apologize. I'm I'm a coal guy, so I'm going to answer <laughs> <laughs> with coal. Uh, the The impediments to coal right now are really regulatory, and it's really EPA, and and uh, it's it's the uh, new source review, it's best available control technology, it's the uh, the the where where are we going with greenhouse gas regulations? Is it legal? The lawsuits that are going on, the efforts going on in the Congress to change that regime, uh, and the um, the the need to put in. Uh, our CEO, Greg Boyce, uh, gave a talk last year to the World Energy Congress in, uh, in Montreal and talked about a Peabody plan, which is super critical, ultra super critical, to replace the older units and to give us growth and, and to reindustrialize. And uh, uh, it's more efficient from a carbon standpoint, uh, near zero criteria pollutants, uh, carbon capture ready as we develop CCS technologies in a regulatory regime and, and uh, put the industrial heartland back to work make the front range safe, safe for coal again in your state, and we've been involved in the natural gas wars there, and uh, we're nothing against natural gas or shale gas, but it's no carbon answer. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, the problem is Washington, D.C. You get outside the beltway, people understand the need for coal. You come in. Right, thank you. And if I could just go down and get a yes or no answer from every single one of you, do, do increasing energy prices pose a threat to our economy? Mr. Kopitz? Well, uh, we haven't. We haven't spoken about oil today. I'm amazed we've been sitting here for, I don't know, about an hour and not <laughs> nary a word on oil. And I was hoping Mr. Green from Texas would come up with a, an oil question. Um, right now, from where we sit, um, the U.S. Has, has fallen into recession every time uh, crude oil consumption as a share of GDP has, in, has exceeded uh, 4%. And that's about eighty-eight dollars more to one hundred nineteen dollars per barrel. We only, we only, I hate to interrupt. We only have about fifty seconds. So, is, is rising in, do so the, rising energy prices the issue pose a threat? Is that energy prices, particularly oil, are critical right now for the U.S. economy? Okay. Mr. Mr. Palmer, uh, I would agree. Uh, Ms. Seligson, without proper policies, it can be a problem. But there are ways to plan. So the answer is yes. Rise, rising energy well, prices you know, pose a threat to our economy. Well, you know, the truth is, China has coal prices above the world average, and it's doing okay right now. So I think there are indications that it If that increases, they'll they be do. fine then? They're prices doing increase. pretty well with high So you prices. then, no, you do not believe that increased it energy prices pose. It can be a threat without right. good Hutzler? policy. I agree. And uh, I want to cite a, a study, recent study, by uh, the Beacon Hill Institute at Suffolk University in Boston concluded that by 2015, consumers in Colorado will be paying about $1.4 billion in higher energy costs as a result of the renewable energy standard. Um, <coughs> do we see energy costs increasing as a result of uh, that kind of policy? Yes. Absolutely. Skyrockets. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired, and the chair uh, would we'll just say those of us from California really feel for your pain in Colorado. Now, at this time, I'll yield to the gentleman from Kansas. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll, I'm happy to talk about oil here in just a second. Uh, but first, I want to I want to just make a comment. I, I heard uh, Mr. Markey say to you, Ms. Atsu, you're a pessimist uh, because you didn't believe these things would happen. We've been investing taxpayer money in wind and solar since the Sin Fuels Corp. I can go back to the ages and uh, the typewriter is still around. Uh, that is, the energies we've been using for a long time are still around, and everything that I see from everyone on this panel suggests they're going to be around for an awfully long time. So you're you're, you're, du you're duly noted that your pessimism is appropriate given the reality of the energy situation I think that uh, the world faces. Uh, Ms. Ms. Seligson, you, you said I think that 8 percent of the coal plants in China have been taken offline and replaced. Is that right? Was that the right number that I read from your testimony? Yes. And that that's not a similar phenomenon has not taken place in the United States? By government mandate, yeah, yes. Right. And so, it, so what is it that's prevented us from doing that in the United States? It's what, what, what has stopped the United States from 
taking older coal plants offline and putting newer coal plants online. It's not the way our laws are written. Right, so it's regulatory burden. Well, no, I mean, this would be an additional regulation if you did this. It's the opposite. You're suggesting mandated. Today we're doing just the opposite. We're penalizing companies that want to take off old power plants and want to put on newer, more efficient plants. Is that correct? I, let me, sure let me give an example. Mr. Palmer, maybe you, you, can, you can help me with this. Uh, today there's a plant in uh, Kansas called the Holcomb Plant. We've been trying to get Holcomb online in Kansas for uh, uh, a long time. Uh, our former governor now creating havoc at Health and Human Services. <laughs> uh, stopped it. We're now, we now started to move forward, and EPA has stuck their ugly hand in the cookie jar again. Uh, they are trying to put on a newer, cleaner technology. Can you tell me what it is besides EPA that is stopping Holcomb from moving forward? It's, it's, first of all, in my past, before Peabody, I was coal supplier to Holcomb. I knew the guys that built the first unit, and I uh, had a great relationship. I love Western Kansas, and uh, I won't go into that, but uh, it's near and dear to me. Secondly, it's all about carbon, full stop. We have the supercritical pulverized coal today, or ultra supercritical, gives you near zero criteria emission pollutants, SOx, NOx, and mercury. There's no argument over that. It's state-of-the-art stuff. It's more efficient on carbon, but it's a carbon agenda. It has been since it started. It is right now. It will continue, and that is what is holding up the next generation of generation in the United States of America of coal generation is this fixation on emission, carbon emissions above everything else as the driving policy here, not in China, in the United States. And that, that is what is preventing Western Kansas from having an additional unit for Holcomb. And that electricity would go to the Front Range and Tri-State, who is a part of my past as well, was going to build that transmission line. And they've been in the, they've been in the carbon wars on these plants since, since Governor Sebelia stepped into it. Uh, and now she skipped town and she's here. But, but uh, it's a bad day for Western Kansas. And it's a bad day for the U.S. when carbon emissions govern our lives every day. And that's what's going Thank on. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now, let me just ask you a different question. Is there anything equivalent to EPA's new Utility Act rules in China? Yeah, there's reviews what, for what all. What would that be? So well, it's, I mean, it's the so they do it independently. They close the old ones, and then they have requirements on the new ones, including EIA so if, for all so new plants. So if, if by chance the Chinese were going to follow the rules and there were Utility Act rules, you say they'd still be able to build these new plants? They, the answer the answer is no. It, it, they, they, they can't. I mean, Holcomb's going to be shut down by these new, new utility macros. Well, the They're point is the Chinese just it. shut down when they feel it ought to be shut down. I've bet right. <laughs> exactly. Precisely. The, the, pr precisely. A, a government agency sh shutting it down. That's what's unfortunately not happening here. We, we are not allowing new technology to move forward, at least in Kansas. Uh, I've been to the Chinese oil fields, most, most all of them. I've spent a significant amount of time there. Are there any regulations, whether they're local provincial regulations or national regulations, on fracking in China? I don't believe there are yet. It's one of the things they're looking at, and they have a cooperative agreement with DOE that they signed during President Obama's visit to China two years ago. Do you think there will be better compliance with those new fracking regulations than, say, with IP rules today? China's compliance in most areas of environmental governance has improved considerably in the last five years. As I say, their ministry is new. This is a new area, and it, the rate of increase is quite impressive. But how fracking will work, I think it would be a little too early to tell. I would also note that Ch the Chinese don't see climate change goals as in any way contradictory with all of their other energy and environment goals. Climate change is the First Thank you, Ms. Suggs. My, in their my, my time plan. is up. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. No speakers on this side, so I'll yield to the gentleman from Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I was interested in Mr. Uh, Congressman Green's uh, comments. I think he missed some of the sarcasm on this side uh, when he thought we were holding China up as the example. I think the point was was that so many of our my colleagues were asking questions about China doesn't do this and China doesn't do that. And then they were being sarcastic when they said, well, don't you think it would be great if we did that? Because I think that everybody understands that the Chinese have a completely different governmental system than we do. But we're getting a little tired of having uh, the administration, uh, the current administration and its allies come in here and say, well, China's great and you ought to be like China. Because we're not going to move 22 million people out of their ancestral home areas in order to have a more efficient hydroelectric system. And we're not going to do some of the things that China has done. All we're asking for, I believe, on 
speaking for myself, is that we have some reasonable regulations and not unreasonable regulations, and I don't believe the Chinese are anywhere near our regulatory scheme. And in that regard, Mr. Palmer, can you tell me, are the Chinese anywhere near our regulatory scheme when it comes to coal, since you're the coal guy? No, I, and I want to put in context my comments about yes, China. Sir. And because I do go to China, and, and I'm, I'm high, I have high admiration for what they have done there. I'm not in here talking about political systems or ideology or any of that. But I see a society that believes in energy supply for people to raise people up and out of poverty. And I think that's what we ought to do here. In terms of the specific question uh, on, the, on the regulatory regime, they have a, you know, they, they have decided as a matter of national policy, they have an ability to do it directly. They have the money in the bank uh, that they've amassed over uh, very shrewdly over a, a period of time. Uh, they are putting in state-of-the-art clean coal technology. That is what they're doing. And they are driving uh, carbon capture and storage research and development and this green gen project that we're in, and that's what they're doing. From that standpoint, from the standpoint of getting our regulations right so we can we can use our own technology, we, have, we are state-of-the-art in terms of technology. We know how to do these things. That's our point, is, is that, that the value, the people value associated with low cost, abundant, always available, reliable electricity as opposed to high prices and scarcity are values we ought to adopt, they've adopted, and we had it before. But right now, in Washington, that is not popular to talk that way, period, full stop. And we think that needs to change. That's, and the, that's why we come at it the way we do. And if, and if we continue down our regulatory scheme, you anticipate that we'll have some scarcity or high Absolutely. prices? Absolutely. There are no, I mean, we're, it's designed to do that. And if when you we, look at the ideology behind the environmental community and you go back 10 or 20 years, it's absolutely designed to do that. And when we do that, we not only drive businesses offshore, am I correct? Yes, you do. But we you also do. raise the cost of, of the average citizen of the United States right. to have the power to heat and, absolutely. and, and make sure that their homes are And every, are every metric safe. says that low-cost electricity is a requirement for more people to live longer and live better. And if you take up the cost of energy, you, d you drive down human health and welfare. So EPA has it exactly wrong in terms of how they come at this, not to argue with the values on emissions, but there is no, no attention paid to the underlying value of the activity that creates the emissions. In other words, what are we making with this fuel that creates emissions and what are the benefits of that? They don't consider that, they don't look at it, and it's not relevant. And we are on a path to high prices in the United States. Absolutely we are. And would you agree with me that if that if uh, you represented a district where the median household income was somewhere around $35,000 a year, that on the tra trajectory we're on on energy costs, that I'm going to have some people that are going to be cold in the wintertime. Isn't that correct? And, I, and I, I, I would totally agree with you, and I would expect they'll be pounding the table in the mornings when you're having coffee with them saying, go back to there, that city, and tell them what's going on here. And, and in fact, we're already seeing it. Isn't that correct? And are you aware that Appalachian <coughs> Power has just asked the Commonwealth of Virginia for, I think, a 9.6 percent increase? I may be off a little bit. I wasn't aware of that specifically, but for sure, uh, the capital investment associated with this, what I call – People call it a train wreck. We have friends in the railroad industry don't like that. I call it a, a two tsunami. It's just with a mess. What's going on with EPA? It's, it's just a mess. It's, when it's, you it's a high price spread. And and the end result is you don't have to be an expert in health to understand that this is going to have a negative impact on the health of the citizens, particularly those who have less economic means than others. I would agree. It's common sense. Thank you. I yield back my 17 seconds. Thank you very much. I appreciate the discussion, especially about keeping the seniors warm. As California, it was always interesting that this town talks a lot about um, helping to keep the seniors get enough uh, fuel so they can stay warm, but they don't talk about those of us in California that our seniors need enough gas to get to the, the shopping center to be able to buy food. But it's a different world all around this country. Mr. Shemkus, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the, the panel for for being here today, and uh, sorry about running back and forth, uh, as we all do a fly-in day, and then uh, pulled off for another meeting. Uh, obviously, we'd like to go in numerous directions, but have limited time. So let, does anyone know about uh, the Judgment Fund? Who can, can anyone tell me about the Judgment Fund? Mr. Palmer? I, I know a little bit about can it. You, can you briefly explain what the Judgment Fund I is? I believe it is a path for... Uh, NGOs uh, typically an NGO is uh, a, a non-government organization. An example that would be Sierra Club, okay, or the 
uh, NRDC or Friends of the Earth or wildlife. And, and what happens in this they process? Sue, they sue the United States. Okay. Uh, on an environmental issue. Right. If, let's say, a, an agency wants to settle that on the grounds that the environmental group is willing to settle it, uh, they get their attorney fees that comes out of the judgment fund, is my understanding. And who funds the judgment fund? The U.S. of A., the Treasury. I think it's on automatic uh, pilot. I think so, it's. I think it's. A, well, let me let me get this right. So you're saying that uh, a NGO, a, na uh, a non-government organization, can sue the national government, and then they can, after there is uh, the legal process, and maybe the agency decides to settle it. Settle it. Or they or the NGO wins the lawsuit. Then the NGO can go to this judgment, it gets which is funded fees. by taxpayers, correct, to pay their legal costs, correct. So that taxpayers are funding these lawsuits against the private sector. Uh, I, I wouldn't characterize the. I, I'll let you characterize it. Well, I'm just but, asking questions. But so, I mean, sure, for sure, it's taxpayer money that is paying the legal fees for these lawsuits. No question. Um, Mrs. Sligerson, China have anything like a judgment fund? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Hutzler, um, this is a, this, I, I kind of like this. Uh, we, we do, you know, we've been preaching all the above energy strategies. I think you mentioned that in some of the question and answers that what China is doing is trying to have more energy across the board, whether it's renewable, whether it's nuclear, whether it's coal. And I think it's important to put in perspective that this is 2035, uh, 10,000 billion kilowatt hours, 74 percent still being produced by coal, but that's 74 percent, even though it's 80 percent, has to be much more coal use. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. Do, we, do you have a percentage of the increase in electricity generation by coal for China in 2035? Uh, no, but I can get that for you. But it's mass. It's pretty yes. massive. Yes. And that's based upon the other question you had about uh, a gigawatt a coal-fired power plant every week, correct? Yes. And those are the stats we've used here for the last couple of years. So I find those um, a, a very, uh, very similar. The um, regulation is is uh, was also discussed by my colleagues back and forth and. Um, anyone who wants to answer this, if there is uncertainty of future regulation, what does that do to the capital markets to build new facilities? Anyone want to take a stab at that? I think in our space, Congressman, in the, in the context of the utilities, when, and you can talk to co-ops, you can talk to Ameren in St. Louis, you can talk to AEP, you can talk to Southern Company, but they, they look at the framework and they say, I've got to put in three or four hundred million dollars on a 250 or 300 or 400 megawatt power plant, and and I've still got out here greenhouse gas emission potential. And so, in, in a, there, a public, I'm sorry to cut you off, but in right. uh, limited time, the uh, Morning Energy reported that the National Air Quality Standard for Ozone, Boiler Mac, Toxic Standards for Power Plants, Coal Ash Rules, and Climate Regs uh, final report should be uh, uh, due August 1st, 2012. Does that discourage? Uh, freezes everybody in their track. It freezes people. Right. Freezes them. Yeah. So the, the old units continue operating that are inefficient. No, you can't upgrade them because you got to go through. A, a well, and I, it's interesting because we talked a lot about super critical power plants, and um, we're working with one now that is state-of-the-art, high-tech, and they're being frozen because of the transport rule. New reg, new power plant, state-of-the-art, Unsure whether they can start because of the trend. Let me finish up. Uh, Mr. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Kopitz, because you've been pretty quiet since I've been up here. Um, I, I was real interested in this because it really kind of addresses the same issue about percentage increase. You project China's oil demand exceeding 50 million barrels per day in the 2025-2030? That's correct. Uh, what do you, um, and so how are they going to do that? They're, they're not. What you end up with is, is in, in 2030, uh, the range of forecasters put it at uh, 105 million barrels a day that we can do. China's about half of global demand growth. So if you take that, you just can't make the numbers work. So that super tanker coming from somewhere, China's going to bid 
against us if we don't do energy security here in this country? Um, They're going to buy up the they, world yes, demand. They, are, they already have. OECD. I mean, the world supply, I should say. Yeah, OECD consumption since the beginning of the, of the recession is down 5 million barrels, and non-OECD consumption is up 6 million barrels. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chimkus. Uh, Mr. Scalise, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you holding this hearing. And, you know, we spent a lot of time today going through the, uh, the various changes in, in China's energy needs and, and how they're planning to meet it. I know many of us on this side are strong proponents of, of an all-of-the-above energy strategy for the United States. Uh, I've been very disappointed by this administration's failure to, to embrace that same kind of approach. Uh, in, in fact, frankly, I know more right now about, based on your testimony, about uh, the things that China is planning over the next 20 or so years than I do about how this country is going to meet the energy needs based on uh, mixed messages we've gotten from the president, uh, especially just over the last few weeks. Uh, of course, I represent uh, an area of South Louisiana where uh, we're still reeling from the impact of the president's permatorium, uh, his, his refusal to let our people go back to work drilling safely in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, gas prices have nearly doubled since President Obama took the oath of office. And I think the fact that they're still holding so many uh, vast reserves uh, away from production in America, uh, you know, the president said last week he wants to reduce imports by a third, uh, and yet the week before that he said he wants to drill in Brazil. And the week so the weeks and weeks before that, uh, he refuses to let our people go back to work uh, drilling safely. Uh, and, and these are companies that had nothing to do with the BP disaster, companies that were drilling uh, and, and exploring for energy in a very safe way that, that are not going back to work. In fact, 12,000 jobs have been lost uh, because of the president's refusal to let them go back to work drilling safely for domestic energy. So, uh, Mr. Kopitz, if you can talk about what you see uh, in terms of the impact of especially the president's actions here in America, uh, and, and specifically as it relates to the Gulf of Mexico with the refusal uh, to have a, a real consistent policy that lets people go back to work who never had any safety issues uh, and the jobs that we've lost from it and the energy security we've lost, we've lost from it. Yeah, the EIA forecasts uh, production in the Gulf of Mexico to drop 600,000 barrels a day from May 2010, so that's immediately following the condo to May 2012. That's 11 percent of U.S. crude production. Uh, so that's a very, very material uh, number, and I would describe that drop as catastrophic. Um, the drop in the drop in exploration. What, uh, the, what specifically drop, would you the categorize? Drop in production. So we anticipate. So the EIA, this is government numbers. EIA anticipates U.S. crude oil production in the Gulf of Mexico to drop about 600,000 barrels a day from the day after Macondo to May 2012. That's 11 percent of U.S. crude oil production. And I know the, uh, again, so getting back to those mixed is, messages, yeah. Is, what is about $30 billion. I think from memory it's $30 billion of, of, uh, of economic activity. It's about $8 billion of taxes. And I calculated about 65,000 uh, man, man years. Those are massive numbers. And clearly if the, if the president wants to talk publicly about a strategy to to reduce imports by a third, which, which, frankly, I think if we were, we were actually utilizing an all-of-the-above uh, strategy that I know our chairman, that, that many of us here uh, would like to see us use, we could absolutely eliminate our dependence on Middle Eastern oil. And, of course, we've seen the volatility over there that's only increasing. Uh, but you don't get there by shutting off American resources and, and literally running these resources to other countries. We know two, we've been tracking the, the deep water rigs that have left America because of the president's policies. Mm -hmm. Two of those rigs went to Egypt. Egypt. And so you, you've got employers saying, I'd rather do business in Egypt than in the United States of America exploring for energy. And, and so I'll ask, I'll ask you, Ms. Hutzler, you had talked about, and I know you've done some studying on this, uh, but when we talk about uh, the uh, looking long range in, in production, and the president is, is bragging today about how high production is, of course, production today is, is really a, an accumulation of, of efforts and exploration over years and years, in many cases long before the president came into office. Uh, if you look at the drop in production we would see, uh, especially because of his policies, have you all looked at how those policies, the, the lack of clear clarity on issuing permits, how that affects uh, our ability to produce in America to meet those growing demands? 
Uh, I don't have a forecast on that, but certainly I agree with Mr. Kopitz that the Energy Information Administration has shown that uh, offshore production in the Gulf of Mexico has gone down dramatically because we're not drilling there. Yeah, and, and you know, again, I, I reiterate, we've lost over 12,000 jobs. Another company just went bankrupt a few weeks ago. Uh, and, and with gas as high as it is, uh, you would think we know we have reserves. These companies would be out there uh, working 24-7. And in fact, because of the president's own policies, they can't even go back to work uh, drilling safely. And, and, and I'll just reiterate, companies that had absolutely nothing to do with the BP horizon, these are companies who had great safety records who are shut down today because of this president's policies. And, and then, you know, he gives these mixed messages, but, but we don't see a clear policy. And so I uh, appreciate your comments and, and yours as well, Mr. Kopitz. And hopefully we can get an all of the above energy strategy. And, and I yield back to balance my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Scalise. And I want to thank uh, the panel today. We appreciate your being here very much. Obviously, the policies in China as it relates to energy uh, has a direct impact on what we're doing in America as well as the rest of the world, and your testimony has been quite helpful. Uh, we will uh, keep the record open for 10 days for any additional material. And uh, with that, this concludes today's hearing, and we look forward to working with all of you as we move forward. So we're, Shenhua is a big part of our CCS work in China. Shenhua is one of our partners. And I, I, thank you so much. I brought all of the press to the Green Gen during the oh, Tianjin did. meeting. Yeah, cool. And, um, <laughs> yeah, they get sick of people coming out there, I promise you. Oh, you know, it, it was so funny. It was the national holiday. Oh, wow. So they said, oh, well, we don't have an official tour. The deputy chief engineer will um, just take you around. Yeah. And he just took it.